on two wheels this week. We ride Honda's new CBR 600. Wayne's back at the Trade Expo and Jeff checks out the biking scene in Japan. You'll remember last week I rode Yamaha's new R6 and I managed to use the word awesome about five or six times or something. Well, this week it's the turn of Honda's latest contender for the new 600cc crown. It's their brand new CBR. Unlike the Yamaha R6, the Honda comes with a proven track record. Since it's launched back in 1987, it's consistently outsold and outperformed the rest. So how do you improve on something that's been arguably the best in its class for over 10 years? Well, what you do is not just another update, but a complete redesign. After three days of atrocious weather and close on 400 miles on the R6, it was a pleasant relief to climb onto the CBR, although it was still raining. Perhaps the fact that it's been around for so long made it feel very familiar. But hang on, this is a totally new bike. Yes, it is a completely new, redesigned top to bottom, that's what they said, and that's exactly what they've done. Of course, redesign means the engine as well. The engine is physically smaller and lighter than ever before. Thanks to a new crank and slimmer crankcases, there's special low friction materials on the cylinders and it now has a shorter stroke. It runs more freely, but it is able to rev much higher. The valve angles have been changed. The fuel now has a more direct route into the cylinders and the cylinder head, that's not been forgotten. That's completely new and again, smaller and lighter than before. In fact, the whole engine is a full three kilos lighter than last year's model. But does it work any better? Out on the road, the CBR is without doubt the most comfortable of the 600 sports class and the motor's about as good as you'll get. Like any sports machine, you need to hit somewhere near 7,000 revs before anything really starts to happen. Below that, it feels, dare I say, a touch on the flat side and as with the R6, that can be a bit of a pain in busy city traffic. But hit the seven grand and above section on those early morning blasts and the CBR really comes into its own. It's not just the engine that's new, of course the bodywork's completely different to previous models as well. The front end now reminds me a little bit of a, a VTR Firestorm, just a touch anyway. And something that you can't fail to notice are these air intakes sticking out the side because for the first time we've now got ram air on a CBR 600. But I don't think these look anywhere as nice as the systems that are used on, say, the R6 and Kawasaki's ZX6R or even Suzuki's GSX-R600. They've all incorporated the intakes into the design of the fairing, whereas Honda, unfortunately, have managed to stick a pair of vacuum cleaner pipes on the front of theirs. It works perfectly well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but I personally think it could perhaps have looked just a little bit nicer. The rest of the bodywork, though, is no problem. Big, new shaped tank, new shaped side panels, and a slightly taller screen than before, so a little bit more protection from the wind blast. And of course, the whole thing has the usual top quality finish, which we've come to expect from a Honda. The handling on previous CBRs has never been in question, so it's no surprise that this latest version feels even sharper. The steering is very light and easy, but still manages to provide enough feedback to let you know exactly what's going on. Never once did the bike feel vague or remote in any way, even when squirted fairly hard along bumpy roads. The standard suspension setup is a touch softer than the R6, which improves comfort for everyday riding. It can, however, be easily adjusted and stiffened up if you fancy blasting around on a track day. It's even easier to adjust the suspension now on the new bike. Compression damping is done from this remote canister here mounted on the subframe. Dead easy to get at, no problem there, it's right in front of you. And the shock itself is in a slightly different position for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's now easier to get at if you want to fiddle with it, but more importantly, it's now got a better working angle on the bike. I suppose we'd better mention the brakes, although there isn't really a great deal to talk about. A pair of 296mm discs up front, being gripped by a pair of four-pot calipers, and a single disc and single-pot caliper at the rear. Nothing fancy, but superb. Do the job perfectly well. You're not going to get dodgy brakes on a bike of this class. 
And class is a word that you'll hear used quite a lot when people talk about this machine. It's got loads of it. It's comfortable, easy to ride, powerful, practical and it doesn't look half bad either. That all sounds pretty impressive but one word I haven't used this time is awesome. That's not to say this bike hasn't got what it takes. It definitely has. I think because it's been around for so long we've almost come to expect it and when it does everything so faultlessly it really comes as no surprise. So how does it compare to the R6? Well, first of all, let's talk about the looks. Now, I personally prefer the look of last year's CBR600. I haven't exactly fallen in love with this new shape yet. Perhaps it'll grow on me, I don't know. The R6, on the other hand, I think looks the business. I think it looks like every sports bike should look. And here's a nice touch. Let me show you this, I like this. Just look where the side lights are. Look at that, up in the corners. Very different, very pretty, very distinctive. So I would say, first of all, on looks, it's 1-0 to the R6. So what about comfort? Well, you've only got to look at the two bikes to see instantly which one is going to be the most comfy. Of course, it's the Honda, the CBR. One-piece dual seat, miles, miles more comfy than this little pad on the R6. It now extends further downwards there at the back of the tank give you a bit more support, it's dead comfy. The riding position is far superior in the comfort stakes to the R6, it's more upright. Bars are higher, a little bit wider and you don't get pushed forward into the tank like you do on this. You hit the brakes at any kind of speed on this and you need some serious padding down the front of your leathers, it's rather painful. So 10 out of 10 to comfort on the CBR600. I make that about level up to now. So what about the engines? Ugh, squeezing between these two bikes, both brand new motors, both super lightweight and full of loads of tricky bits and fancy technology. Both excellent. I have to say though that the R6 felt a little bit more buzzy when you started to wind it up than the CBR600, but really nothing to complain about. The R6 red lines at an incredible 15 and a half thousand, CBR600 13 and a half thousand, but you can have loads of fun below that. They both need to be spinning at over 7,000 before anything starts to get really exciting. And they're both a bit of a pain around town. When you get about 4,000 revs, they still a little bit flat and fluffy and uh, can be a bit of a nuisance, but really it's not a problem. Both superb, so up to now, we're still level. So nothing to choose between them yet. Let's talk about what you might call features. And a big improvement on this model of CBR is you can stick your key in the little hole there quick turn and the seat now comes off complete as one unit dead easy no side panels to undo or nothing and you've got a bit of storage space there you'd get a u-lock under it maybe some waterproofs and a pair of gloves and probably some rather flat sandwiches but uh, a big improvement on previous models on the r6 another turn of the key and a little pillion pad pops off there and you've got a rather small compartment there of course there's a toolkit there but you wouldn't get very much there. So I would say at the back end, seating arrangements and seating compartments, the Honda's probably got the edge. Now then, let's come and have a look up at the front end. This dashboard layer on the R6 might look very basic. Uh, it might not look like you're getting a lot for your money, but this digital speedo and white face rev counter is just so functional, it's so easy to read. A quick glance down, you can see exactly where the revs are. You can even read the speed accurately when you're traveling at speed. So 10 out of 10 for that, which is more than I can say for the Honda. The problem with this dashboard is, whilst it's very nicely laid out and looks rather classy, it's actually very difficult to use. It's very difficult to read. The numbers are very, very small. The clocks have got black faces. White face clocks would have been so much easier to see. The trouble is when you're moving quite fast and you look down, your eyes have to refocus on the very small digits and that takes a few seconds to get an accurate reading. You can't just glance like you can on the R6, by which time you've traveled quite a distance. Not very good, I'm sorry to say. So up the front end, dashboard, 10 out of 10 to the R6, but under seat compartment storage, well, the Honda's won that one. So we're still level. So just one thing left to compare then, and that's possibly the most important thing, the price. So 6,300 pounds puts your new CBR600 on the road against £6,500 for the new R6. What's 200 quid between friends? So which one should you buy? 
Well, you really do need to be very clear on what you're buying it for. Radical, high performance, very focused sports machine, fantastic for a track day, and it's an R6. If you want something that you can still take on the track day, keep up with everybody you've ever wanted to keep up with, but will do a bit more and a lot more comfy, then you buy a CBR 600. There's no doubt this CBR 600 will suit more people than an R6. That's not to dismiss the R6, it's a cracking bike. Really, it's whatever you want to do with it. And it's all down to which one do you like the look of the best. Both of these bikes will outperform you and your mates put together. They're fantastic, they're awesome. I've said it again. So, you pay your money, and you really takes your pick. Japan, a long way away, yes? Everyone eats sushi, yes? Population of small people riding small bikes? Well, yes, yes, except for Westerners eating noodles with chopsticks, and wrong. The people aren't so small, and there are plenty of big bikes about. When I went to Japan for Honda's 50th celebrations, it was an eye-opener to me. Even in Tokyo, it's not all high-tech and high-speed. There's narrow streets with power cables that run overhead, and fewer bikes than I thought. Bicycles, yes. Buy one at the supermarket. Thousands of them, everywhere. Even some with a baby on board. Almost like China, but what isn't like China is the traffic. Cars rule the roost and park like they're roosting too. There's no room otherwise. When it comes to bikes though, I saw more big bikes than small. But the bike shops I visited certainly had a lot of 400s like this 400 CX500, if you see what I mean. This nice 400 Kawasaki Balius and a neat V-twin Yamaha. But some bikes were not all they seemed. This Honda Magda is a 50 and knee-high to a grasshopper. There were also some other really neat mini bikes like this 200 Yamaha Trellis Frame Beauty and this Honda NSR 50, yes, 50cc. Some schoolgirls, though, seemed to think that mini bikes were not for me. All right, how about a Julio or Julio in Spanish scooter? No? Well, what about this immaculate refurbished 84 750 Katana at 399,000 yen? That's roughly 2,000 pounds. Plenty to choose from, whatever your taste, as these two found out on the ZZR 1100. Who's been polishing his helmet then? One thing that any biker mustn't miss in Tokyo is Corins. No, I'm not being funny. Not Collins, Corins. This is the epicenter for bikers, if not for earthquakes. One street is completely occupied by this outfit, who are so protective of their prices that no filming is allowed either in or outside their shops. I wanted to bring you a shot of the no camera sign, but wasn't even allowed that. All I got was some Brit dealers looking for bargains. From bandanas to bikes, Corins had everything. But it seems a quick fit spare service could also be in demand. In fact, it gives curb crawling a whole new meaning. But this guy wasn't alone in his perfectly legal curbside activities. Others tinkered and improvised too. Sorry mate, I don't know where it goes either. Meanwhile, our friend continued to dismantle his clutch on his beloved Harley. Talking of Harleys, they are incredibly popular. They are a pose machine supreme after all, and people pose as you'd expect. That's the attraction. But the numbers were still surprising. It must be USA imagery, but it still seems strange that in the land of the custom clones, even the patriotic Japanese still prefer the real thing or at least some do. The cool dude here seemed happy with the homegrown Springer Forked Honda version. Take a look around a bike park at any meeting though and you'll see everything under the sun, rising or otherwise. A Ducati Dharma, a Hickley Thunderbird, BMWs, a Buell, an R1 of course, bikers chilling out, 
a girl having coffee in the Ace Cafe, even a rare K1 BMW, a VMAX, a girl in a floppy hat, could be anywhere. In fact, only when you ride through rice fields as the sun goes down and you notice that the traffic lights go sideways, do you remember that you're still in Japan. Sayonara, Biker-san. Yeah, well, I know what you mean. Yeah, it is a problem. People who are big and that lot do have a bit of trouble getting kit and that for leather suits. But dynamic leathers here have got the job sussed, you know. You know how? Because they do a size 50 inch one piece racing style suit. 300 quidish. Now, it's pretty impressive, that, isn't it? I think that's impressive, size 50. You don't think that's impressive? <laughs> All right, then. If you don't think that's impressive, just check out the size of this, then. This glove. I I don't put a size to this extra, 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 extra large glove. And you won't get that for $29.95. Real leather. I really can't imagine what the jacket looks like that belongs to the fella who owns that hand. So you lads out there, when you go in the shops and you buy your nylon gear and everything, and you pick it up and you think, there's no way that this will protect me. I'm not wearing nylon. I'm not wearing textiles. I trust me leather. Think again. Because this company, Bolson, Swiss, tough stuff it's built like tanks very very strong loads of armor in it pretty bright if you want the colors reflective and everything it's damn tough stuff and i imagine if you hit the deck with that on i would think it will probably save your butt well okay i'll talk to you later on okay nice to meet you though all the best to you yep see you later new brand new name actually but a, a sort of an established manufacturer at barnard castle here in the uk which is a rarity for waterproof clothing i must admit Although there are many brands on the market with various different names that imply their origins are wherever, Germany, Holland, Sweden or whatever, a lot of them are made in the Far East, nothing wrong with that, but a lot of people out there happen to like the idea of a UK manufactured product. Fair dinkum. Well, if you want one, it is one. Bite wears the brand. This particular jacket's called the T5. Very much like a lot of other stuff that's available with a few nice little ideas. It's got the standard idea of the Cordura and it's got reflective on it and it's got Permatex which is a drop liner to keep you wa waterproof, all those things. But it's got a really lovely soft collar, that is really nice. It's got an adjuster on the back of the collar here so you can tighten that up real nice and tight so it's snug and you don't get a draft down the back of your neck. Nice and tight waistband there with adjusters on just the same and poppers on the bottom. I like this bit here. It's not exactly marvellous, but it's clever. That zip goes up and down. <laughs> Nothing special about that, you might add. But if you wanted to release the tension on your arm while you're walking the streets rather than riding your bike, then you just pull the zip from the top and that releases it. Because it is a tight fit round your arm because it's got the full Knox protection in there and obviously it is best that it fits tight to you. So that's the idea of that. And if you do lift that up and get in there as well, you can indeed by opening the Velcro, get to the body protection to remove it if you so desire. It's got a detachable liner, just like many of have, washable and so on. Pretty impressive, and it'll cost you around 220 quid, and the girls out there might like the fact that there's a full range of ladies' sizes done as well. Spiddy, you must have heard of Spiddy. It's a huge concern in Italy, and a lot of top GP riders and superbike riders wear the kit. One piece leathers, obviously, in their case. But they do manufacture a range of clothing for you and me out on the street, keep you warm and dry and so on. And because the origin is Italian, the tendency is then to apply a little bit of the old venting through the jacket so in the summer it keeps you cool. Now, colours. Orange. I honestly believe that orange is the colour for this year. We've had our red, blues, silvers, whatever, and they're still obviously regular lines, classic colours that'll stick forever. But yellow came into the fray over the last couple of years, bright, no harm in being bright and seen, granted, but I think maybe the orange, and of course new firestorms done in this orange, and many more. Nice bit of kit. Orange, would you see, be seen wearing that? Well, why not? Because you would be seen, it's bright and it's vivid. And if you believe that speed is beyond your reach, financially, you can have a kit like that, a jacket like that, for 65 quid. Damn good value for money, and you can be seen posing in some fancy spiddy gear. Talking of spiddy and posing, check these out. 
Uh, serious colours them, aren't they? We know there's a Speedy Glove that sells for £250. I've featured it before on the programme. It is the business, and if you want to protect yourself, that's the way to do it. But you can have a Speedy Carbon Fancy Glove for around 85 quid. Not three bad, eh? <laughs> well, they don't like me doing road testing, even little ones like this. But yes, would you believe it? This is indeed one of them there scooters with an engine, a seat, and would you believe road legal? Huh, but that's another story. I'll just get rid of that because I want to tell you about this stuff. This stuff is a Dutch company called Revit, okay? Very stylish gear, very well made. I mean, I've checked it over. Fully armoured with armour that when you've got the jacket on you just don't feel it's there and that applies to both the leather gear and the material gear prices are very relevant aren't they we all want to know what we get for our money and how good value of money it is but i ain't going to go down all the avenues of all this fancy high-tech stuff and everything because let's be fair basically appearance is a deciding factor very often certainly in leather but you can have that bit of kit there which is high tech it's got lots of features trust me looks the business 220 quid and I really think that they have got the job sussed. They've also applied the same sort of price structure to their material gear as well. Now take a look at that. It looks like a regular anorak. It does weigh a fair bit and the reason being is it's fully kitted out with some very serious armour. But again, when you've got it on, you don't know it's there. It's relatively cool in the summer and you have got a detachable liner and it's kept cool by having air vents and so on. But if, believe it or not, by means of having a drop liner in it, it's also waterproof. And that is less than 150 quid. Not bad, eh? At the 1998 International Bike Show, we got our first look at Suzuki's new GSX-1300R, the Hayabusa. On two wheels next week, I take it for a ride on a racetrack in Barcelona. <laughs>